Steve gave a good introduction to my talk and my presentation. Um, as I was coming here this morning, I realised all the things that I wanted to fit into this one hour lecture and I couldn't fit in and, and Steve covered some of those things, so that, that's quite useful. But as with all of these one hour lectures, it's hard to squeeze everything in a particular topic into that one hour. So I'm sure there'll, there'll be some things in here that I've missed or glossed over or skipped over quickly. So hopefully I'll get through it and we can um, have time for questions at the end. Okay, so I'm talking about organised convection. Now what is organised convection? Hmm. I'm missing, oh there, there's my outline. So my outline slide is in the wrong spot, it should be there. All right. So my outline of what I'm talking about today, what is organised convection? Um, and then I'll go into types of organised convection, some of the terms that we often use and often hear and sometimes don't know what, we, what they mean or we misuse those terms. And then I'll talk in more detail about conceptual models of organised convection. So what, how do organised systems or mesoscale convective systems, um, how do they form and how, do they, how are they maintained? And then I'll talk about something called gregarious or so self-organised convection and then coastal organisation as well, which is some people, some purists might say that's not organised convection at all, but I will argue that it is. So going back to my other slide, what is organised convection? So Steve actually showed this image or a version of this image at the top, which is an ordinary thunderstorm or a or a um, air mass thunderstorm, where you go through this development where you have growth of the storm, where you have rising motion, um, development of precipitation, and then through in the dissipating stages you have uh, stratiform precipitation. So that's your ordinary um, disorganised system where it's really just one cell that rises, you get condensation, you get precipitation, and then it dissipates over time. An example of an organised convective system is a multicellular thunderstorm, which is shown at the bottom here. Now, this isn't the only type of organised convection, but it's an example of organised convection. Where, at any one time, you have multiple convective cells going through different stages of their life cycle. So here you see um, rising convective systems. We've got different convective cells through different stages of growth. We have deep convective cells with convective rainfall and then we have part of the storm in the dissipating stage. So you've got your anvil cloud, you've got your stratiform precipitation but at the same time you have convective precipitation. And that convective precipitation, that stratiform precipitation is quite important in feeding a low level cold pool, a region of cool air which I'll talk about in more detail later and that cold pool, that cool air plays a key role in initiating new convective systems and new cells. All right, so there's a, there's a significant difference here between your air mass thunderstorm and your organised system because we have the initiation of new cells in the organised system. So, if you look up in the textbooks what organised convection is, Either they won't spell it out explicitly, they'll just assume that you know what it is, or you'll get a variety of different definitions. Now, these are my definitions, and so you may disagree with them or disagree with them. Um, and the two key aspects of this, convection that is long-lived and convection that grows upscale in the spatial dimension. So convection that is long-lived means that it lasts longer than an individual convective cell. So to do this, it generates circulations or has some associated circulations that initiate new cells and help maintain it. Convection that grows up scale, so it's larger in spatial scale than an individual thunderstorm, so it covers an area larger than an individual convective cell, can be comprised of a group of cells in one cloud system, such as a multi-cell storm or a cluster of clouds that are organised together 
in some way. Now, how do we get it? It can be formed by a variety of mechanisms. Large-scale forcing can help organise convection. Interactions with the large-scale flow, so convection interacting with the large-scale flow itself, so not the large-scale flow actually initiating the, the convection. Um, convection can generate its own circulations to maintain it. This is something called self-organisation. I'll talk about self-organisation later. So here's an example of organised convection. You'll see this. Uh, this is a, I think it's from um, the International Space Station. You've got <coughs> a large thunderstorm here, which is and it's mature and you've got a bit of enamel forming there, so it's approaching its dissipating stage. You've got another cell there that's in its growth stage and another larger cell there. So here are multiple thunderstorms that are arrange themselves and organise themselves together. So we have now have a cloud system which is larger in horizontal scale than one convective cell or one thunderstorm. And there's this hierarchy of organisation. So Andrew this morning was talking about the Madden-Julian oscillation. This is a satellite image. This is the Indian Ocean through here. And this large region of cloud from the satellite image is an active region of the Madden-Julian oscillation. And you can see embedded with that, within that large region of cloud, you have these other structures. You can see a large line-like structure here. You have these other lines through here and through here as well. So embedded within this Madden-Julian oscillation event, you have a hierarchy of scales uh, which are themselves organised convective systems. So here's a schematic, and, and this is from an older paper, uh, Nakazawa from 1988, which actually shows a schematic of this hierarchy of convective organisation in the tropics. So on the left here, we have these large regions of intraseasonal variability or intraseasonal variation. So you can think of these as an active region of the MJO, or you can think of it as a, as a Kelvin wave with active convection within it as well. Embedded within these regions of intraseasonal variability are these large, what are labelled here as superclusters. And if you zoom in on a supercluster, what you have are uh, these smaller cloud clusters, which would be called mesoscale convective systems. And so you see this hierarchy of, of organisation where we have these smaller scale systems, which are uh, longer lived uh, mesoscale convective systems, these groups of mesoscale convective systems, which are called here superclusters, which are all embedded within this broader region of intraseasonal variability. So some of these terms that I've just used, and once again, if, if you search for definitions of these things, you get slightly different definitions or no definition at all. Um, so I looked at the AMS glossary, and uh, the AMS glossary, um, if you look at the hard copy of the AMS glossary, it's this big, thick book that's advertised in the dictionary. It's actually a pretty useful resource, but it's all online now. Um, so I looked at the AMS glossary and said, okay, what do they define as, as organised convection? And they actually don't have a definition of organised convection at all. But they do have definitions of mesoscale convective systems, and that's an MCS, we often, and I'll talk about MCSs a lot, a cloud system that occurs in connection with an ensemble of thunderstorms and produces a contiguous precipitation area on the order of 100 kilometres or more in horizontal scale in at least one direction. So that encompasses a lot of forms of convective organisation, whether you have large circular systems or linear systems like squall lines. Cloud clusters. Now, the AMS glossary calls cloud clusters basically the same as MCSs, but usually <coughs> tropical MCSs. Now, that's not exactly consistent with the, the usage in the literature. In the literature, Cloud clusters can be defined in any particular way. A cluster of clouds of a certain area cannot 
show you some examples of those. A mesoscale convective complex, or MCC, this is a term that's often used a lot. Sometimes it's misused. And there's a specific definition of an MCC which dates back to this paper in 1980 um, by Maddox. And this is basically a definition that came about from analysis of satellite imagery. And so it was, it was this early stages of the satellite era. We could see these satellite images and infrared images and examine mesoscale convective systems. And so this definition of a mesoscale convective complex came about. That it has to um, be approximately circular, has to be long-lived, greater than six hours. Greater than six hours is probably the, the temporal resolution of the data that they were using. Um, have an area greater than 10 to the 5 kilometres squared with an infrared temperature of less than minus 32 degrees Celsius and a colder region as well that um, has an area greater than 0.5 by 10 to the 5 square kilometres. So that's a mesoscale convective complex. So that's a subset of mesoscale convective systems. All MCCs are MCSs, but not all MCSs are MCCs, just to confuse you. So supercluster is something that is hard to find a definition for. Uh, you hear it used a lot, it's used a lot in the literature. Uh, all the papers that I looked at for the definitions had slightly different definitions, and they range from a large MCS, a group of MCSs, or a cluster that lasts for more than a few days. So there's various definitions of superclusters as well. To give you a couple of examples, here's a mesoscale convective system over Darwin from a radar image, and you can see this, this line of, of convective cells. So this is a squall line. It's actually got a bow shape, so it could be called a bow echo type system with this broader region of stratiform precipitation behind the convective line. Um, and on the right here is a system that satisfies the definition of a mesoscale convective complex. So that's an MCC, and it's also an MCS, because all MCCs are MCSs. So if we want to look at cloud clusters in the tropics, from this uh, paper by Mason Howes in 93, they mapped out over three austral summer seasons, um, all of the cloud clusters, which these are actually quite small cloud clusters with um, areas of 1,000 to 3,000 square kilometres, so they may not all actually satisfy the definition of a mesoscale convective system. You can see that there's this very broad distribution of cloud clusters across, there's no map drawn on here, but if you look at the, where the clusters are, you can kind of work out where the continents are. So this is the, the Pacific Ocean, this broad distribution of cloud clusters over the Pacific, a more concentrated distribution over the island, over Australia and New Guinea and Borneo and Sumatra. These are two different times. The top plot is at nine local time, so the middle of the domain, I think, and the, the um, 9 a.m. local time. And the second plot is 6 p.m. Okay, so this is late afternoon, early evening. This is early morning. And immediately you can see that there's this strong diurnal variation in cloud cluster occurrence with concentrated cloud clusters over the land in the late mm -hmm. afternoon and they move offshore and there are very few over the land in the early morning. So that's small cloud clusters. If you go to larger ones, which most would satisfy the mesoscale definition, you see that there's actually um, a significant difference. A lot of the region of the maritime continent has very few of these. These larger mesoscale convective systems aren't really occurring over the, the high topography over New Guinea and Borneo and Sumatra because their circulations are disrupted by that high topography. But you are seeing a concentrated area of mesoscale convective systems <coughs> to the north of Australia. Um, and a lot of these are initiated and form over land and this is consistent with what Steve was showing with a lot of intense convection over land. And if you look at estimates of um, the amount of rainfall that comes from mesoscale convective systems, you can see that 
even though they might, may not occur particularly frequently, we're not getting mesoscale convective systems every hour and not even every day over certain locations, these large systems that are long-lived produce a lot of rain, both through the convective scale portion of the rain and the stratiform part of the rain. And you can see from this estimate, from this, this study here, that a very large proportion of the rain is in the tropics is coming from mesoscale convective systems. And we're seeing up around 70% in large regions of the tropics and at least 50% in most regions of the tropics of the rainfall is coming from mesoscale convective systems. If we look at mesoscale convective complexes, so these are these circular, larger <coughs> systems which satisfy this specific definition, uh, through the shading here, we see that's where most of the uh, mesoscale convective complexes occur, and you can see that most of them are actually uh, occurring uh, over land and have some interaction with topography. And so uh, the formation and the growth to these large circular MCCs is actually um, clearly linked to land-based circulations, whether it's topography or low-level jets and um, processes like that. All right, so a lot of the theory for mesoscale convective systems, and so now I'm going to talk about the processes and the fundamental dynamics of mesoscale convective systems. A lot of the theory around these have come, have been derived from uh, mid-latitude systems. But as I'll show you in a minute, there's a lot of similarity between uh, mid-latitude systems and tropical <coughs> systems. So if you're asking most people in this field to draw a squall line or draw a mesoscale convective system, they draw something like this. And this is uh, what's often called a leading line <coughs> trailing stratiform mesoscale convective system. It's called this because the system would be moving from my left, from left to right, so from that side to that side, so the storm motion is in that direction there. And the leading convective line comes first and trailing behind that is this large region. Now, Steve mentioned that if you were to draw this, this is actually not how these systems look, right? Because you've got these large regions of ascent and front to rear flow, large regions of descent. So at any instant in time, the flow field doesn't look like this. But this is the time averaged flow field. So the, the quasi-steady circulation is associated with this storm, and certainly in the convective region of the storm, through different times, you have updrafts rising, you have convective downdrafts. So there's a lot of up and down motion going on in this leading convective part of the storm. So this is your quasi-steady circulation, mesoscale circulation associated with the system. So the key thing, you've got air flowing in, rising up in the mesoscale part of the storm, moving to the rear of the storm. You have some air that will move to the front of the storm as well. You also have this large region of descending rear inflow, <coughs> uh, which is part of it, is a large part of it is underneath the cloud and you have precipitation falling into it. Here's your region of heavy convective showers. Here's your region of stratiform rain a larger region of rain with lower intensity, intensity than the convective region. A similar schematic uh, was developed for the tropics. And it's quite detailed schematic, um, but if you look closely, it actually shows a very similar structure. It's just reversed, pointing the other direction, so the system is propagating in that way now. Here's your leading convective line, air flowing in, rising in the convective part of the storm, flowing out the back of the storm, and you've got this large region of stratiform rain. Your convective precipitation here, and if you look closely, it says saturated convective scale downdrafts. So you've got uh, these downdrafts that have relative humidity close to 100%, so they're close to saturated. What's key here for mesoscale <coughs> systems and mesoscale organisation is that you also have this 
large region of mesoscale and saturated downdraft. So you've got this large downdraft region. And as this air flows down underneath the storm and precipitation falls through it, that precipitation evaporates and it cools that mesoscale downdraft and that feeds, helps feed this layer of cool air that forms along the surface. And this is typically just called a cold pool. So you get these cold pools that form <laughs> along the surface that are partly formed by the convective downdrafts and in a mesoscale system they're fed in a significant way by the mesoscale downdrafts with their associated evaporation. This is an even a much simpler schematic of this process uh, coming from an idealised theoretical model which basically has, now it's reversed in the other direction again, so they keep on getting reversed because a tropical one <coughs> might travel, will typically travel from east to west and um, a mid-latitude storm will typically travel from west <coughs> to east, not always. Um, so here's our idealised model where you have the inflow that rises up in the um, convective part of the storm and flows out the back. It's often called a jump up draft. Oftentimes you'll have mid-level flow that'll flow out the front of the storm, called our overturning up draft, and then we have our mesoscale downdraft circulation which feeds the cold pool and flows out the back of the storm and you have a, a stagnation point here which defines the speed of propagation of the system. So as I said, a lot of the theory around convective systems have, has come from mid-latitude storms and there are these two papers which are very influ influential papers that really describe how long-lived convective systems, mesoscale convective systems and squall lines are maintained. And the explanation is strongly related to the low-level wind shear. So let's first look at a, a single storm with no mean wind. You get precipitation, you get a downdraft, air flows down, reaches the surface, your cold pool starts to spread out or your cold air spreads out. And as that cold air propagates away, you get these leading edges of the gust front or the leading edge of a cold pool or a density current that propagate away from the storm. And they have circulations associated with them. They have vorticity associated with them that arises mostly due to the horizontal buoyancy gradients, which generates these circulations where you have flow along the surface flowing in the direction of the gust front propagation and return flow aloft. So you get this type of circulation on this side and an op opposing circulation on the other side. As soon as you have low level wind shear in the background flow, such as shown here, and even though the wind arrows are pointing that way, the wind shear vector is pointing that way, you start to get interaction between these gust fronts and the edges of the cold pool and the wind shear. And so on this side, well the, the circulation associated with the wind shear is clockwise. And on this side of the storm, it's in the opposing direction to the circulation associated with the gust front. So these two circulations interact and create enhanced descent on that side of the storm. On the other side of the storm, you have the circulation associated with the gust front of the same sense as the circulation associated with the wind shear and you don't get it enhanced. And this is the key thing for um, long-lived convective systems, this interaction between gust fronts and shear. And so as part of this theory, you can view the evolution of storms that start to rise, no precipitation, no cold pool, the storms are essentially tilted in the same direction as the low-level wind shear, but as the cold pool develops, you get this interaction between the vorticity at the edges of the gust front and the ambient vorticity of the wind shear, and the system uh, becomes more upright, 
And as that cold pull strengthens, the system will tilt in the opposite direction to the wind shear. And the key aspect of this is that this enhanced descent at the leading edge is what's initiating new cells. As the air flows in, the background air flows in, flows up and over the edge of the cold pool and initiates a new convective system or a new <coughs> convective cell. And that feeds into this process of convective initiation at the leading edge of the gust front, development of the convective system and then decay of the, of the system at the back of the storm where you have the stratiform precipitation. So you can view this image, this image is quite good because it depicts the evolution of the storms from initial stages through to mature stages but also depicts the different behaviour of different storms with different strength shear or different st strength cold pools. If you have a system with very weak or non-existent cold pools it's going to be tilted down shear and you don't have an interaction between the cold pool and the mean shear. If you have a system with a moderately strong cold pool, um, it interacts well with the wind shear and will initiate these upright storms. And if you have a, a system with a very strong cold pool, you'll get this tilted system which looks like your canonical uh, leading, leading line trailing stratiform type system. Now these trailing stratiform type systems aren't the only convective systems. They're, in the mid-latitudes, they're certainly the most common. And um, this paper depicts, well, does a survey of, of a large number of mesoscale convective systems and comes up with the um, environmental wind pro behavior that defines the different characteristics. So at the top here, we have a leading line trailing stratiform type system which starts off as a line of convective um, cells and then develops this trailing stratiform region. And the wind shear associated with that has um, this fairly strong low level shear <coughs> and the tilt of the system is in the opposite direction to the wind shear. But then there are these other storms which have leading stratiforms, so the rain actually falls ahead of the storm and there are other storms that have parallel stratiform, so the stratiform region is aligned along the convective line, not before it and not after it. And it's essentially changes in the wind shear, which is changing the characteristics of these storms. Uh, for the leading stratiform, you actually have str quite strong upper level shear, which is essentially blowing the cloudy air to the front of the storm. And in the parallel stratiform type system, you have a lot of wind shear along the, along the system, along the line. So this paper um, did a survey for mid-latitude storms. And if you look at tropical systems, you actually see a similar behaviour. If you have large low-level shear, you get these line type systems. So this arrow represents the low-level shear, well, the one uh, label with an L is low level shear and one label with an M is middle level shear. And so on the top right where you have strong low level shear, you get these linear systems, linear mid-scale convective systems like score lines. When you have strong mid-level shear, you get an elongated system but it's more like a parallel stratiform type system. And when you have very weak shear, you get these strange circular systems. And that's actually convection being initiated at the leading edge of the cold pool. So it's the cold pool that is initiating the systems, but you're not getting this preferred ascent on either side of the cold pool. So you're getting um, a circular shape to your convective systems. Now there's these different orientations of the storms. Some are more long-lived than others, and it's really this type of system that is the most long-lived because um, the configuration is such that the stratiform rain doesn't rain into the air that's flowing into the system. 
It doesn't disrupt the updrafts in the convective cells. It helps feed the low-level cold pool. So what about tropical convective systems? So certainly these mesoscale convective systems that I've shown you, these type of things, um, these type of systems, and even these type of systems, some of these line type systems, a lot of these line type systems that you see in the tropics are well explained by this mid-latitude theory where you have interactions between cold pools and the low-level wind shear to generate these squall-like systems, initiation of new cells at the leading edge of the cold pool to generate this, these long-lived systems that are maintained. However, in the tropics, we often have lots of convective organisation, but we don't necessarily have those conditions that are consistent with this mid-latitude theory for squall lines. For example, often the low-level shear isn't particularly strong. Often the low levels in the tropics are near saturated, very moist, near saturated, and so you can't get a lot of evaporation and you can't get very strong cold pools. But then in those situations you can still get convective organisation. So how, how is this occurring? Certainly clustering and upscale growth with systems are ubiquitous in the tropics. You see them everywhere. And so in this satellite image, uh, looking at all these tropical systems, you see that there's lots of clustering, lots of organised systems. If you look closely, you can see some linear structures in there. Uh, so in the tropics, you get a great deal of organisation. One reason for this is that the convective inhibition in the tropics is often very small. Now, Steve spoke a fair bit about CAFE in his talk. Um, I think you briefly mentioned SIN, convective inhibition, is essentially the amount of work that you need to do to lift a parcel until it's um, neutrally buoyant and can continue to rise. So the amount of work that needs to be done to actually tap into the CAFE. And people often call, call it, the SIN is the negative CAPE, the little bit that you have to do to release the CAPE, or sometimes it's called the CAP, what's keeping the the atmosphere relatively stable, so you have to do a little bit of work to make the atmosphere convect. And in the mid latitudes, a lot of that is done by surface heating over the land, or it's done by cold fronts, or it's done by orographic forcing. But over the open ocean in the tropics, um, you often have very small amounts of convective inhibition. So you don't actually have to do a little bit of work. There's very much work to initiate convection. And so small perturbations can really kick off convection and you can get a lot of organisation um, occurring over the open ocean. So convective inhibition is very small. So even if we don't get very strong cold pools because there's not a lot of evaporation, we can still initiate a lot of convection. Now in this paper in 93, uh, Brian Mapes, who's at University of Miami uh, at the moment, talked about tropical convection being gregarious, prone to forming clusters and superclusters. And he explained this as a result of horizontally propagating gravity waves that destabilise the environment, environment around existing clouds and promote a new convection in a different way to what's normally explained by these mid-latitude theories. And so the issue, one of the issues that's discussed in this paper is that oftentimes in convective systems in the tropics, when you get this rapid upscale growth, rapid organisation, the growth of the convective system occurs to an area larger than what you might expect your cold pool to extend to, and faster than the cold pool can actually propagate. So you get a system 
that starts to grow upscale at a much faster rate than can be explained by Coulson type arguments. And that, that's what, that was one of the motivations for looking into the role of gravity waves in, um, in initiating and promoting clustering of new convection. Now this week, have you spoken about gravity waves? I know you've spoken about Kelvin waves. Have you spoken about gravity waves at all? Yes? Yes? Okay, so you know what gravity waves are. Good. Okay, so here's, here's the argument. One thing that gravity waves do is that they communicate information to the environment. When you have a convective system, a mesoscale convective system, what that does, it locally heats the atmosphere, diabatic heating associated with condensation, and you also get local cooling of the atmosphere from evaporation. So within our mesoscale convective system, we have heating and cooling. And you can often decompose that heating into a deep heating profile where you've got heating throughout the troposphere, throughout the depth of your cloud, as well as a low level region of low level cooling associated with evaporation and precipitation. So as soon as you have heating and cooling in these storms, what the gravity waves do, they propagate away and communicate that heating and cooling to the environment. So you get, that's depicted here as these little pulses of variations in the potential temperature. Now one thing about gravity waves, or at least hydrostatic gravity waves, is that the deeper the vertical wavelength is, the faster those waves propagate. So this deep heating generates these waves, deep, with deep vertical wavelengths, that propagate very fast away from the storm. So here's our gravity wave propagating quickly away from the, the storm, and what that's doing is transmitting that that heating in the storm to the environment and warming the environment through descent and stabilisation of the environment. So the first thing that these waves do, they propagate away from the storm, warm the environment and stabilise it through subsidence. But then, once they start precipitating, you get a different wave that propagates away. A wave really forced by the low level cooling associated with evaporation. You get a wave with this shorter vertical wavelength, which often has a vertical wavelength like the depth of the convection or the depth of the troposphere. That propagates away slower after this earlier stabilising wave and it cools at low levels through ascent at low <coughs> levels. And that second wave propagates away and destabilises the environment. So wherever you have this low level cooling, you actually have destabilisation. So what this mesoscale convective system has done is generated these waves that propagate away from the storm, they first stabilise the environment, but then they destabilise the environment and create this large region around the storm which has reduced convective inhibition and is more prone to, co to convective development. And because in the tropics the convective inhibition is often so small, that can lead to rapid expansion and rapid growth of convective systems. Now through this um, this paper, an older paper, when both Michael and I were much younger than we currently are, um, back in 2001, uh, we looked at this problem and, and said, OK, how does this work? Let's quantify this, this change in the convective inhibition associated with storms. So we ran a numerical model with an idealised thunderstorm that's in this region marked by blue and looked at the wave structures that propagated away from it. And these contours are perturbations in potential temperature. So where we have warming with the solid contours, we have a stabilisation of the environment. And where we have cooling at low levels, so these dashed contours, we have destabilisation. And what you can see in this real sound resolving model simulation is that you get this same passage of a deep wave that warms and stabilises the environment, followed by a shallower wave that destabilises this region around the storm. And if you look at convective inhibition, so this is distance from the storm versus time, you can see that the convective inhibition 
initially increases, so those solid contours are, uh, give you an increase in convective inhibition, but shortly thereafter you get this broad region of reduced convective inhibition that propagates away from the storm, in this case at 15 metres per second. And it reduces the convective inhibition by about 50%, I think, in this case. So this idea of a cloud modifying its environment to promote new convection is an example of what's called self-organisation of storms. So it's not large-scale forcing creating the organisation, which you might see along the edge of the cold front or something like that. It's when the system itself generates circulations that allows the system to grow upscale in both time and space. And this is an example from some more cloud resolving model simulations. These are idealised simulations with no mean wind. There's no mean wind in these simulations at all. What I'm showing here is distance in one dimension for the CRM simulation, and this is time along here in hours. And what I've done in this simulation is basically you cool the, the atmosphere and that cooling destabilises the atmosphere and allows convection to develop. Initially, you start to get lots of little clouds, convective clouds, that just bubble around. And soon, you start to see these propagating structures. And these are cold pools that start to propagate away. As you get prevalence of um, clouds forming on these cold pools that are propagating away. Still, there's a lot of symmetry. There's nothing really jumping out as being asymmetric at these early times because there's no wind at all. There's nothing really to organise these systems. But then, through interaction between these systems, interaction between cold pools, you start to get the formation of larger systems that then start to propagate. So they start to generate their own circulations to allow them to propagate in preferred directions. And then very quickly, you get this heterogeneity which... Um, Steve talked about where you have these dry patches and you have these moist patches, you get more convection over the moist patches and you get these propagating systems. So this is a, a good example of self-organising convection. It's done all of this itself. Generate the own, its own circulations to allow the convection to become organised. This type of self-organisation is, is depicted here in this um, schematic from Moncrief 92, where it shows that in a cloud population, you can have a lot of clouds, a lot of convective systems in different stages of organisation. If you had the mean flow, for example, like this, the wind shear would be pointing to the right. You can get these weaker storms that are uh, <coughs> tilted down shear, but then through this region, you can have these larger upshear mesoscale convective systems. And these can form spontaneously, as I showed you in the previ previous slide. And you see that in reality, that you have these patches of organisation surrounded by patches with just regular popcorn type convection. Now, how does this occur? Well, there's feedback, as Steve showed, between the convection and the water vapour field. You get this horizontal variation in water vapour, meaning some areas are more prone to, to, to development <coughs> and some areas aren't. But you also get variations in the mean flow. So if you were to take an average of the mean flow over this box here, and you took an average of the mean flow over this box, they would look quite different. That's because the convective systems are modifying the mean flow locally. And the way they do that is through something called convective momentum transport. And what you can show is if you do Reynolds averaging of the momentum equations, you can show that for a given mean flow, you, can de well, you define this in a various different ways. Let's assume that we have some large scale flow, which is your large scale time varying mean flow, and your small scale flow associated with the convection, the perturbations associated with the convection. And you can show, if you make quite a few assumptions, that the 
time variation of the mean flow is related to the vertical divergence of the vertical flux of horizontal momentum. So the vertical derivative of this term here, which is your vertical flux of horizontal momentum. It's often called the Reynolds stress term, or one of the Reynolds stress terms. And what this can show is if this term on the right-hand side is non-zero, you can get the convection and the perturbations associated with the convection modifying the mean flow. Now, at convective scales, so your convective updrafts and downdrafts, <laughs> often this is this behaves in a down gradient or a diffusive type manner. So the, the convective um, updrafts and downdrafts are essentially trying to mix out the shear. But as soon as you have mesoscale circulation, so more coherent circulations, they can have either a down gradient, a mixing type effect, or a counter gradient um, type effect on the main, main flow. And the down gradient effect essentially, like mixing, reduces the shear. The counter gradient can actually enhance the shear. It's all related to, for mesoscale circulations, the tilt of those convective systems. For example, in a <coughs> system that, tilt, that is tilted to the right, no matter whether you have updrafts or downdrafts, a system tilted Sorry, that's tilted to the left. A system like this tilted to the left, whether you have updrafts or downdrafts, they normally both would have a negative value of this vertical flux of horizontal momentum. And if the systems were tilted to the right, they would have a positive vertical flux of horizontal momentum. And so then, the tilt of the mesoscale circulation associated with a convective system can determine the sign of the momentum flux and therefore the sign of the tendency on the mean flow. And essentially, a system that is tilted down shear can enhance the mean flow. A system that is tilted up shear will reduce the mean flow. And so, convective systems, once they start to organise, can locally modify the mean flow and can either enhance or suppress the tendency for continued organisation. And so that's one way um, convective systems self-organise or allow cloud populations to self-organise. There's also this term self-aggregation, which is becoming quite popular. Now, I view self-aggregation as a special form of self-organisation. And this term self-aggregation or aggregation has, has come out originally from cloud resolving model simulations like this, where you have a certain cloud resolving model domain, you run it for a long time towards an equilibrium state, and in certain scenarios, the clouds will clump together and create this so-called aggregated convective system, where you get one big convective system in your model domain. Um, this is a really active area of research. Lots of the people looking at this self-aggregation problem. Um, and this is explained by feedback between moisture and radiation in particular uh, that forms this. But it's interesting because uh, you only get this type of aggregated clump of convection for specific configurations of a model domain. So it's not entirely clear how realistic this is and how whether it represents um, the real world at all, because it takes a long time to run your simulations for a really long time before they produce this aggregated state. And certainly the, the organised clusters that you see in the real world will often form much quicker than what you're seeing in these type of simulations. I, um, I actually don't like the term aggregation because it implies that you've got clouds, a bunch of clouds that some, somehow come together and stick together and form a bigger cloud. And I don't think that's really how the real atmosphere works. You have clouds that are continually forming and decaying and they will form and decay in a, re in a certain region. So it's not really a, a clumping or aggregation of clouds at all. 
it is a self-organisation of clouds in a system. And, and so I think aggregation is one of these examples of a term that replaces an existing term but it actually doesn't ex fully explain um, what it's trying to re replace, if that makes any sense at all. All right, in my last few minutes I'm going to talk about coastal organisation. Because coastal regions and orographic circulations uh, play a really important role in initiating convection, especially in the tropics, and we see a large amount of precipitation along coastal regions in the tropical in the, in the tropics, especially in the maritime continent region to the north of Australia. So from this paper, Martin, who's sitting back there, this is a figure that I've taken from his, his paper, uh, he developed this algorithm which identifies precipitation that is in line in some way with a coastal region. So if precipitation is aligned with a coast, he identifies it, he identifies it and calls it coastal rainfall. And this figure depicts that coastal rainfall. And so uh, on the left is DGF, on the right is June, July, August. And the top panels show the amount of rainfall that is aligned to the coastline, aligned to the closest coastline. And you can see that there's a large amount of rainfall here that's aligned close to the coastline. Now, we already know that there's a lot of rainfall there anyway, but if you look at the amount of this coastal <coughs> rainfall as a proportion of the total rainfall, you can see that this maritime continent region and the region of Central America as well is this hot spot for coastal rainfall. So in the tropics, we get a lot of this coastal organisation of rainfall. Now, why is that? Well, it's, there's a lot more moisture in the tropics, right? That's one reason. And we also see a very strong diurnal cycle, which, is, which comes together with the coastal part, because um, if we look at rainfall uh, over the maritime continent region, you see it has this very strong diurnal cycle uh, with strong rainfall in the, in the evening and um, late afternoon, early evening, and all of that strong rainfall is aligned along the coast and it's aligned with orography. And then as you move into the early morning, you see that a lot of that rainfall moves offshore. Right, so we're seeing this strong diurnal cycle in rainfall along the coasts. Um, and one explanation for this is sea breezes, sea and land breezes. So we get sea and land breezes everywhere, right? So why are the tropics special? Why do the tropics produce more convection along the coasts and extending further offshore than in the mid-latitudes? You see here, this is all...